Well, once again, good evening to you. Um, as I said before, we're going to be looking at the subject of atheism tonight, and um, it's a very relevant topic. Anyone who's uh, tried sharing a witnessing uh, of Christ and sharing the gospel uh, will know that we, we, there are an awful lot of people who say, well, I am an atheist. I, I don't believe in God. Uh, and so I hope that will be very relevant to you tonight, and I hope that you'll find it useful uh, and informative. Um, I'd like to sort of start by way of an introduction in, I guess you might say, sort of slightly unconventional style. Uh, I'd like to start by reading a poem by John Clifford. And the poem is called The Anvil of God's Words. Last eve I passed beside a blacksmith's door and heard the anvil sing the vesper chime. Then looking in I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with blasting years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he. And then, with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's words, for ages, sceptic blows have beat upon. Yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the hammers gone. I think of all uh, sceptic blows on the anvil of God's words, probably some of the most furious blows have been dealt by those that call themselves atheists. And uh, tonight I want to start in a very matter-of-fact way by defining what the word atheism means. What is atheism? Well, you might think it's a simple you know, question, but you know, even the word atheism itself is undergoing a redefinition in our times. There are people that are trying to expand the word to incorporate different views, like verificationism and agnosticism. Atheists are saying, now no, this is just atheism. But we want to expand it to incorporate these different views views. So it's important that we start with this issue by defining our terms as this sort of blurring of the lines is significant. And it may in fact go to show why in part it seems or it appears that atheism is growing so quickly is that it is this blurring of the lines, this redefining of atheism. So what is the correct way to define atheism? Well, put simply, an atheist is one who does not believe in the existence of God or gods. We can reach that different definition by simply following the rules of plain English. So if I can explain it like this, you can ever just close your eyes a second and picture in your mind the capital letter A. Okay? The capital letter A is symmetrical. Yes? Okay, don't worry, don't get nervous, I'm not going to ask you to work something difficult out. So the capital letter A is symmetrical. Now picture the capital letter E in your mind. That is A, symmetrical. In other words, it is the, op the opposite, isn't it? Oh, symmetrical. Okay. A person who believes in the existence of God, or gods, is a theist. A person who believes the opposite of that, in other words, who doesn't believe in the existence of God or gods, is an atheist. That is the correct meaning of the term. However, atheists have been pushing to revise this definition. Atheist Stephen Roberts, speaking of sort of monotheists in general, said, I contend that we are both atheists. I just believe in one fewer gods than you do. This is a telling statement made by uh, Stephen Roberts for a number of reasons. And it sort of lifts the lid, if you like, on the atheist worldview. 
it shows that Roberts has no appreciation of the difference between the gods of ancient mythology, who were sometimes created beings, often limited to appearing in one place at one time, imperfect in knowledge, localized in power, and the God of Christianity, creator of everything, God of everything, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, spaceless, timeless, immaterial. There's a world of difference between these two concepts. It also shows that Robert's view of the history of religion is as an evolutionary process, finally resulting in the highest evolutionary state, the abandonment of all gods. In other words, atheism. This is his view. And it's an argument that we'll look at in more detail later on. I'm going to take you through a few of the uh, very common atheist arguments and show you why they are not plausible. In order to understand atheism, we have to comprehend not only how the atheist sees the world, but also how sort of intertwined the theory of evolution is with the atheist mindset. To an atheist, evolution is not just a theory of biological science. In fact, I don't think I've ever met an atheist who believed it was a theory. They believed that it is scientific fact. Evolution to an atheist is a psychological and philosophical framework through which they actually view the world. That being the case, the atheist sees himself or herself as being superior in the evolutionary sense to those who hold to traditional and religious views of the world. They see, uh, if you like, an evolutionary parallel in religion. That given enough time, the majority of reasonable and intelligent people will dispense with belief in the one God, just as they dispense with the belief in the gods, and ultimately they will accept that there is no God. Throughout this talk, I will uh, repudiate that delusion. How evolved is atheism? Has man truly arrived at his position after years and years of critical thinking? Has the history of religion been progressing towards atheism? Has the uh, abandonment of religious belief been a sort of um, a chronological thing? These are questions that are actually quite easy to answer in the light of historical evidence. You know, I once asked an atheist if he was aware that all the founding members of the Royal Society, which is one of the oldest scientific academies, did he know that all the founding members of the Royal Society were Bible-believing Christians? His response was, well, they would have been at that time. His assumption being that at one time, everybody in England believed in the Bible. Everybody in England was a Christian. Again, historically, it is quite easy to refute uh, such a statement, which uh, I will do as we go on. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9 says this, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. As we will see, atheism is actually far from new. We give you a brief history of atheistic thought. About 570 BC, uh, we see Greek philosophers like Xenophes, sorry, Xenophanes, Epicurus, and Lucretius start to expand what today might be regarded as <coughs> atheistic ideas. They're not, they're not atheists per se. But we're expounding atheistic ideas. By 106 BC, we have a man called Marcus Tullius Cicero. Uh, he believed that there was no need for man to be controlled by the gods, and so he designed his own moral 
framework and even had it published. Then just as humanistic philosophy was becoming more widespread, more popular, we encounter someone called Jesus of Nazareth. Christ and the early church have an enormous impact on the Middle East and Europe. God's timing is absolutely perfect because at this time all the nations around there are speaking Greek. Everyone understands the Greek language. Well, not all speaking Greek, but they understand the Greek language because Alexander the Great conquered that area and so lots of people learn Greek. So the New Testament appears written in Greek and it spreads very, very quickly. The Gospel spreads very quickly, enabling the message of salvation to reach all the people of that sort of Middle Eastern and European uh, world. Yet following this, we start to see a resurgence of Greek philosophical thought, particularly Plato and Aristotle. Even if you read your New Testament and you read, and you read uh, 1 Corinthians, you can see that there's an influence there of Greek philosophy that the Apostle Paul is having to deal with and say, no, that, that, that's wrong. This influences people like Thomas Aquinas, who's a Roman Catholic theologian and philosopher in the 13th century. So the church then starts to move away from the biblical foundation, starts to move away from the, the Bible. As a result, it becomes weaker. It's the same today. The more the church moves away from the scriptures, the more it moves away from the Bible, the weaker the church becomes. The Renaissance, although it's not an atheistic movement, but it does introduce the doubt of absolute truth. Just like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, yea, hath God said? So skepticism and unbelief begin to spread across Europe. With the help of people like Niccolo Machiavelli, who inspires the synonym Old Nick, uh, as you know, is a term for the devil. In fact, when we get to the 1500s, we've got people like Hugh Latimer, who is a well-known Christian reformer and, and eventually Christian martyr, who warns King Edward VI that many Englishmen have stopped believing in the existence of heaven and hell. This is way back, way back in the 1500s. Then we have an evangelical revival taking place in the 1700s. People like Jonathan Edwards going back to Bible basics, thousands getting saved. And yet John Wesley remarks that there have never been a more wicked and godless generation than this. Now you speak to an atheist, they'll tell you, oh, these are the days when everybody believed the Bible. These are the days when everybody was a Christian. But well, history doesn't bear that out. In the 1800s, Charles Darwin questions the biblical account of creation. People like Friedrich Nietzsche uh, announces that God is dead. Yet we also see again thousands coming to Christ through the preaching of D.L. Moody, through the preaching of William Booth and others. So it can be seen that far from something new or something that has evolved, something that's been a result of progressive thinking, atheism has always been around in one form or another, even before the birth of Christ, and has been accepted by some and rejected by others. Job in chapter 42, verse 3 of the book that bears his name says to God, Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Now there is no room in atheism for things that men know not. There is no acceptance that there are some things that we will never know. The expectation is that man may eventually, given enough time, know all things. This is part of the conflict that it has with Christianity. This is what the atheist sees himself as knowledgeable, intelligent, well informed, wise, 
Whereas the Bible simply calls him a fool. One of the, if you like, selling points of atheism is that it is for the intelligentsia. If you are an atheist, uh, uh, you, you, you like to make out that you are highly intelligent, educated, discerning, uh, prudent. It's certainly not for the fool. There are high profile atheist personalities like Professor Richard Dawkins, scientists, philosophers, academics, and so on. But let me say this the majority of atheists are not scientists and they're not philosophers. They are shop assistants, bus drivers, plumbers, nurses. They are Mr. and Mrs. Average. Average education, average knowledge of the world around them. They are more likely to have watched a David Attenborough film on evolution than have read Darwin's Origin of Species. Let me ask, generally ask a question. Is it intelligent, is it prudent to risk the whole of one's eternity on a book that you've never read. And yet people will do that. They will do that. In fact, when it comes to eternal things, atheists are generally ignorant. Now, I'm not using that as a term of abuse. I'm not name calling. I'm not suggesting that atheists have a lower IQ than Christians. But what I'm saying is atheism thrives on Ignorance. Ignorance of the Bible, ignorance of Christian theology, ignorance of church history, ignorance of world history. Books like uh, Christopher Hitchens' God is Not Great and Dawkins' The God Delusion work by lumping together all sorts of Christian denominations and sects, put them all in the same bag if you like. Uh, they work by um, uh, putting Catholics and Protestants together and simply calling them Christians. This is so that Christianity as a whole, Methodists, Baptists, Anglicans, Presbyterians, Calvinists, Arminians, can all be found guilty of perpetrating religious atrocities like the Crusades. It's so they can then say, you are to blame for this. This position is intellectually and historically dishonest. It ignores the historical fact that the Roman Catholic Church, in the time of Henry VIII and Mary I, martyred as many, if not more, Bible-believing Christians than anybody else in the world. This is a historical fact. It is a position that refuses to recognize that Islam and Christianity are mutually exclusive, therefore fundamentally incompatible. To suggest that, that all of these uh, that I have mentioned are in some way on the same side it is just willful ignorance, or worse, it is deliberate falsehood. So these books are not intellectual or academic books. These books that you see uh, people buying in their millions, that, that they brandish. Uh, uh, this is a fantastic book, you ought to read it. These are not academic books. They're not highly intelligent books. They're often rhetorical. They don't enter into discussion about the, the issues. They are, in a sense, kind of gung-ho books, sometimes resorting to prose. Well, they're, they're aimed at the emotions rather than at the head. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. I'd like to give you a quote from a book called In Defense of Atheism. This is a book written by Michael Onfray, published in 2006, uh, and chapter five, entitled, ironically enough, On Christian Ignorance. Uh, page 52 says this, believers and churchgoers don't go upset. Often undereducated, 
informed only by the crumbs of information they are fed by the clergy. Sunday Mass has never glittered as a place of reflection, he says. So you have a moment to enjoy that. There is so much wrong with this short quote. By the way, I could have picked almost any page in this book. There is so much wrong with this short quote that it is hard to know where to start. But let's just examine it a little bit in closer detail. Often undereducated, uh, he bemoans. How does he know? How does he know that? Has he spoken to all the multitudes of people that attend churches throughout the Western Hemisphere? Does he have the details of their academic qualifications in front of him as he writes his book? Often undereducated. How often? What are the figures? Who did the survey? When was he privy to the information? It's clearly embarrassing, prejudice, and just ludicrous generalisation. Informed only by the crumbs of information, they are fed by the clergy. Well, is Michael Onfray not aware that some congregations, like the Brethren, don't even have clergy? Once again, how does he know that the only information they, quote, are fed are from the clergy? They may get their information from other places. They may read books. They may surf the internet. They may visit libraries, learn informally from Christian friends, learn from relatives or from Christian work colleagues. They may listen to podcasts. They may watch DVDs. They may read Christian magazines. Hey, they may even study the Bible for themselves. How is Michael Onfray able to speak so knowingly about things that are unknown? By the way, did you notice how Christian ignorance suddenly became Roman Catholic ignorance? As he shifts focus to the Sunday Mass. Does he not know that the concept of the Mass is an offence to Protestants? Well, this does not discourage Michael Onfray from planting them in the same bed. Like two seeds covering them over so you can't tell whether they're apples or oranges. And he just points and says, they're the same. That's the technique. He claims, by the way, that the Mass is apparently somewhere that has never glittered as a place of reflection. Yeah, very poetic. Once again, how does he know that? <coughs> I seem to recall that Martin Luther reflected quite a lot during the Mass to examine the true meaning of righteousness, a reflection that ultimately changed the church and the world through the Reformation. Now that's some reflection. We live in an age where many young people are becoming atheists. They are convinced of their intellectual superiority over Christians. To quote an internet atheist, T.J. Kirk, you are stupid. Yes, that's you, Christian. You are stupid, he says. Fortunately, bold assertion is not the end of the argument. It is after this that many uh, young atheists start to struggle. They are not conversant with biblical Theology. Even a sort of Sunday school level of understanding is becoming a rare thing as our society becomes more and more secularized. People don't even just have a basic knowledge of the stories of Jesus, you know. I remember an American evangelist friend saying that he'd been gone down to a university and was witnessing to a college student there who thought that the Bible had been written by King James. Dr. William Lane Craig was a respected Christian debater and a research professor at Talbot School of Theology has received many emails and messages from Richard Dawkins fans. Some of you may remember that he wanted to debate Richard Dawkins, I think it was at Oxford University, and Dawkins uh, said he was, quote, too busy. <laughs> uh, but, but this is, 
uh, uh, um, William Lane Craig was asked to characterize the people, the atheists, the Dawkins fans that were, were getting in touch with them. And so he did that. And this is how he described them. He said they are unsophisticated, inept, sophomoric, they cannot think logically, uninformed, silly, ignorant, and the result of an education system that has been dumbed down. Now these are not just simply insults. They are conclusions that we can provide evidence for by examining the more popular forms of atheist argumentation. So let's have a look at some of the very popular atheist arguments. Maybe even an atheist has used this against you. One of the more popular ones is known as the genetic argument. And it will go something like this. The only reason you're a Christian is because you were born in the West. If you'd been born in Saudi Arabia, you would have been a Muslim. If you'd been born in Scandinavia at the time of the Vikings, you would have believed in Thor. If you'd lived in ancient Greece, you would have believed in Zeus and Apollo. This is what's known in philosophical circles as a genetic fallacy. The fact that someone may become a Christian because of cultural or geographical uh, or social influences in no way disproves the existence of God. It cannot be used as a way of disproving, therefore, God doesn't exist. That's irrelevant. The fact, however, whatever the reason is why a person becomes a Christian cannot be then used to say, therefore, God doesn't exist. Exists. You know, people become Christians for all different reasons. People change their religion. People brought up in a religious family may become atheists. People brought up in an atheist family may become Christians. None of this has any bearing on whether God exists or not. Another argument that we touched on earlier is the evolution of religion argument. This argument. Uh, is really a mantra that you will encounter again and again in atheism. And it would go something like this. Mankind used to believe in a pantheon of gods. Then belief evolved into monotheism, the belief in one god, and soon it will become a belief in no gods. Oh, wait a moment. Is that really true? Did everyone used to believe in a whole pantheon of gods in the ancient world? The ancient Hebrew Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Conversely, you could look at Mormonism, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That came out of the culture of American evangelical Christianity, monotheism, and evolved into the, probably the most pantheistic religion there is. They believe in a tripantheon of gods. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They believe they're three separate gods. And we believe in the Trinity here, but that, that's three persons, one being. But Mormons believe in three separate gods. But they also believe that you can become a god. And they believe in an almost unlimited number of gods. That's the, the widest pantheon of gods there can possibly be, but it comes out of culture that is monotheistic. In fact, it is the Bible that presents the truth about religious history. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 1, verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, as we see in Greek and Roman mythology, and to birds and four-footed beasts, as we see in African and Native American Indian mythology, and creeping things, as we see in elements of Egyptian mythology. So the Bible tells the correct history of religion. We start with one God, and then because of sin, we get more and more gods. Starting with man as a god, 
and then uh, um, getting worse and worse, and so they end up worshipping creeping things, insects, snakes, lizards, that kind of thing. The truth is that when all godly wisdom is abandoned and the heart is hardened against the conscience, then the result is a belief in no God. Also, if religion is evolving, why do pantheistic religions and monotheistic religions exist together simultaneously at the same time? Why do they exist alongside atheism? So on closer inspection, many of these arguments just simply do not bear intelligent scrutiny. They just don't work as an argument. Atheists will often find fault with the argumentation of Christians by asserting that when Christians can't find evidence for something or an explanation that is based on, on material evidence, they just say, God did it. This is called the God of the Gaps argument. Maybe you've heard of that popular one with uh, Richard Dawkins. The God of the Gaps argument. Yet, you know, atheists may well be guilty of hypocrisy here if they apply this criticism. If when they are challenged about the mysteries of creation, they say, well, it happened by chance. Are they not saying, chance did it? They are guilty of a chance of the gaps argument. Filling in the gaps just by saying, yeah, chance did it. Well, I don't have to answer that because it happened by chance. To believe that science has all the answers, even when there is no physical evidence to support that hypothesis, is nothing less than exercising faith. There's no evidence, and yet you determinedly believe it. That is Faith. Faith not in God, but in that, more specifically, in science. Hence we get the word scientism. Scientism. The term scientism is used to indicate the improper usage of science or scientific claims. Using science in contexts where science might not apply such as when the topic is perceived to be beyond the scope of scientific inquiry. Imagine if your wife said to you, I'm sorry, I no longer love you. What would you do? Would you go and say, well, I'm going to need a sample of your DNA to work out why that is? Or maybe you just talk to her and say, what's the problem? You see, science doesn't always immediately have the answer to everything. But but people who subscribe to scientism say it does. It would include, in, include a, sorry, it would include an excessive deference to the claims made by scientists or an uncritical eagerness to accept any result that was described as scientific. Now some atheists have claimed that uh, the burden of proof lays on the Christian to produce uh, evidence for the existence of God. They say one cannot prove the non-existence of a thing. Yet this is a logically incorrect statement. We can prove that there are no square circles. We can prove that there are no married bachelors. We can prove that there are no theist atheists. Christian cosmologist Martin Rees puts it, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. No atheist has ever been able to prove that God does not exist. So we're left with this idea that somehow the world is becoming more and more atheist, and that everybody is abandoning religion and is becoming an atheist. Um, let me tell you that that is not supported by the demographics. Let's just talk facts for a moment. In the 2011 census uh, in the UK, 14.1 million people, that's about a quarter of the whole population, 25% of England and Wales said they have no religion. 
This was after a strenuous campaign by the British Humanist Society to get people to tick the no religion box. So that still leaves three quarters of the population who are not ready to rule out the existence of God. Now, I'm not saying they're Christians, but they're not ready to say, I'm atheist. In the USA, according to the 2011 Gallup poll, more than nine out of 10 Americans said yes when asked the basic question, do you believe in God? Let's transfer that now to the whole world, to a worldwide consideration. According to the World Factbook of 2010, atheists comprise an estimated, are you ready for this? 2.01% of the world population. Not exactly overtaking the world, is it? 2.01% of the world population. In fact, there's been an e increase in people defining themselves as having a belief in God because of the collapse of communism. And these people are now starting to search for God again and starting to say, well, we, you know, are, we're interested in spiritual things. After having this, this uh, uh, you know, uh, mandatory atheistic political system enforced upon them, they're still searching <coughs> for God. I find that very reassuring. So if atheism is not the choice of the majority of people across the globe, and clearly and demographically it is not, if atheism has not proved that God does not exist, if the conclusion of atheism is not based on irrefutable evidence, then what is it based on? In a word, I believe that it is based on faith. It is based on a belief system that sees the world in a particular way. It is evangelistic in its approach to those who do not share that belief system. In short, I believe that it is a religion, or at the very least, a kind of cult. <coughs> the object of its worship just happens to be man. Now perhaps you think that I'm going too far uh, in saying that. Think again. In January 2013, stand-up comedians Sanderson Jones and Pippa Evans started the first Sunday Assembly in North London as they, quote, both wanted to do something like church but without God. Here's a quote from the, the Sunday Assembly website. See what it says. The Sunday Assembly is a godless congregation. Now you might think there's enough of those around already. It's a godless congregation that celebrates life. Our vision? A godless congregation in every town, city and village that wants one. All the best bits of church, they say, and awesome pop songs. Atheists gather together, they sing songs, they listen to readings and talks, they support charities. In Brighton there is an atheist street preacher. You know there's an old saying, it looks like a dog, it walks like a dog, and it wags its tail like a dog, then it's probably a dog. I think it is undeniable that what we're dealing with here is another religion. That's what it is. It is exactly as they say, a church without God. A religion that worships man. That is idolatry. The Bible says all idolaters will have their place in the lake of fire. Revelation 21. They say, that's the warning. <coughs> Until Christians realize that this is what atheism is, they will waste many hours debating and arguing and trying to convince atheists through the application of logic and reason. It won't work. Atheism does not respond to logic and reason. That's why the Bible calls the atheist the fool. 
They protest that they do not see any evidence for the existence of God, but they do. Romans 1, 19 says, That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. God has shown them himself to them. He's presented himself to them. In fact, in verse 20 it says, They are without excuse. If they hadn't seen any evidence of God, maybe they'd have an excuse. But they are without excuse. Any belief system that replaces God with someone or something else is idolatrous. It is spiritual and it is devilish. That is the source. There is a spirit behind it that has blinded the eyes of the minds of those people who subscribe to it. There is a strong man, as Jesus puts it in Luke 11, 21-22, a strong man, and the armour in which he trusts is people's scepticism, ignorance, and pride. If we are to plunder and spoil his goods, then we must prayerfully approach atheists with an understanding that what is needed is the gospel. For it alone is the power of God unto salvation. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, for all your blessings to us as a fellowship and to uh, the grace and the mercy that you show to the Christians that are here present this evening, Lord. We thank you for the power of the truth of your word. Uh, dear Lord, I, 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 I'm reminded of the words of the missionary James Hudson Taylor, who said there are three things that absolutely uh, uh, cannot be refuted. One, there is a God. Two, he has revealed himself to us through the pages of the Bible. And three, he means what he says. And we take you at your word today, Lord. We really do. And pray, Lord, that for all the people here, Lord, that, that what has been uh, given in terms of information tonight might be a benefit to them, it might be a benefit to the establishing of your kingdom in the hearts of men and women. Lord, I pray that this wonderful and, and, and soul-saving gospel might go out there, Lord, might just, just fill this land of ours, Lord. We pray for those atheists that live near us, that are in our families, that are in our towns. Lord, we pray for them that they might be awakened to the truth. Lord, we pray that we might be able to look at them with hearts that love them, that we might love them into the kingdom, but Lord, that we might not hold back on telling them the truth, the truth of the gospel, that they need salvation from their sins. And we look at the many people that I know who have become Christians, Lord, have, have previously been atheists. And so, Lord, we know that there would have been a time maybe when we adopted the same position. We just pray, Lord, you break them out of that delusion that they might come to a knowledge of the truth, a saving knowledge. In Jesus' name.